Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sunshine Menezes. I am the Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and welcome to our webinar series. Uh, we call this Climate Change in the News because mostly, but not exclusively, uh, we use this webinar series to talk with people who are doing research and communication and um, policy work related to climate change. But in fact, we actually talk about a lot of other environmental topics as well. And today's webinar is a good example of that when we will be learning about a really great tool the Northeast Regional um, Ocean Data Portal, um, which is uh, run by the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, and you're going to hear a lot more about that from today's speakers, Dr. Emily Shemshenia and Nick Napoli. Um, Emily Shemshenia is a marine scientist who has been um, working at the interface of, of science and decision making and public audiences for um, a number of years now. Um, she's been working for the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, or NROC, since 2014, at first leading the development of a project collecting marine life and habitat data and coordinating science outreach to support the Northeast Ocean Plan, which was the first regional ocean plan in the United States. Now she manages the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, which involves uh, identifying data priorities, managing data development and review with other agencies and stakeholders, and also conducting trainings and workshops. Emily is also an independent consultant and manages a portfolio of projects that all relate to synthesizing ocean data for decision-making purposes. She earned her PhD from the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography in Oceanography and actually began working with Metcalf Institute as a graduate student with our annual science immersion workshop for journalists. Nick Napoli is a consultant who um, works via contract with the um, Northeast Regional Ocean Council as their ocean planning director. In his capacity, he manages the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. He also manages the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, known as MARCO. Um, he has over 20 years of diverse planning experience that ranges from producing development and management plans for communities, public lands, and National Park Service properties to advancing the development and implementation of coastal and marine plans. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Shamshania. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar and really the reason we reached out and partnered with Metcalf on this topic um, was that we're really trying to build awareness, uh, build um, just folks' knowledge that the portal is a resource that exists. Um, so the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, which we affectionately call just the portal, um, is a free public resource um, of over 4,000 map products showing the footprint of ocean activities and resources. Um, and depending on how you define map products, it's, you know, it could be up to 10,000. We, we really have thousands and thousands of resources on the page. Um, that we want to t tell you a little bit about today. So the URL is www.northeastoceandata.org, um, and I fully expect that you're right now going to open up another tab and start exploring in there. I highly encourage you to do that. I'm just going to give a little bit of background um, now on what the portal is, who, uh, use, who created the portal, and who uses the portal, and that context you feel free to explore the portal while I'm providing that context. I think it's, you know, perfect, perfect match. Um, then we'll delve in. I'll actually do a live demo of the portal and show you some of the tools and resources. So you'll have a base familiarity if you, if you do take me up on this offer to open a tab and check it out. So, um, like I said, a free public resource. Uh, federal, state, and stakeholder uh, groups have provided the majority of the data on the portal. Um, and stakeholders include scientists, industry, and other non-governmental organizations. So it's really a team effort, a lot of different folks coming together to build these data products um, and inform these data products. And because of that, they're customized to address the stakeholder needs and interests in the region. Um, and we take a lot of guidance and a lot of advice on what people need, what questions they have in the region on various topics, and um, how data sets could address those, 
And we work really hard to make sure the data sets do address those questions and are timely and, um, like we said here, customized. So um, once we do develop those data products, the stakeholders don't go away. We actually um, continue the partnership. They inform um, how those data products are presented on the portal, and they help us vet them and review them and ensure that the spatial patterns that we're representing on the portal are accurate or as accurate as they can be considering the data available. Okay, so thank you uh, to Sunshine and Metcalf for, for hosting this, and thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, I'll just talk quickly about the Northeast Regional Ocean Council. It was established in 2005 by the governors of uh, New England states, and uh, it's a voluntary forum uh, for the states uh, and federal agencies and any regional organizations that want to participate. Um, in, and it was established to sort of address uh, regional ocean issues. Uh, the state and federal agencies co-chair it. Uh, there are three pri priority areas where the, um, the council works, healthy ocean and coastal ecosystems, coastal hazards, and ocean planning. Where Emily and I do most of our work is uh, in ocean planning. Uh, the Ocean Planning Committee in 2009 established the Northeast Ocean Data Portal 10 years ago almost, um, and also supported the development of the Northeast Ocean Plan. Um, and uh, honestly, 10 years ago, when we established this, the hope was to be where we are now. Uh, and this slide, um, while uh, terrible uh, for presentations and breaking every rule of using PowerPoint, is fantastic for explaining the range of uses um, for the portal. Uh, these are just some select case studies. We know of many more but they represent how the portal is now being used. And a lot of this is really in the last three years. I think actually all of this is in the last three years. So for planning and management, uh, there's a lot of decisions that are often made by the New England, Fishery, uh, New England Fisheries Management Council on uh, fisheries management decisions. Recently, uh, when there have been alternatives for decisions there, they've put the, the spatial data, the maps for the alternatives up on our portal so that stakeholders um, and others can access that information. Uh, there's been a lot of going on with offshore wind development. Um, you can see uh, some examples here on this slide. Uh, recently, the Vineyard Wind Project has a draft EIS out. That environmental impact statement has uh, maps from the portal in it. Uh, we know that many stakeholders use the portal to comment on various developments with, with offshore wind. Uh, and we know also that some of the developers and their consultants are using it to support their projects. Um, one other one I'd like to point out, uh, because it's always interesting to hear when the Coast Guard or the Navy is doing something, but the Coast Guard is using the portal for uh, waterways management. Um, there's a couple of, of scenarios that they use it, and we're actually going to put a case study up on our page about it. And, and the U.S. Navy has used it to uh, identify areas where testing uh, autonomous vehicle vessels um, might not affect other stakeholders. So there's a number of examples here. I think Emily's going to show you uh, where you might be able to go read more about these. Thanks, Nick. Um, the other things we just want to share with you quickly before we get into a live demo um, is sort of the flip side of that with all of those uses that Nick described, even though they're just a snapshot of the regulatory and siting management and education and research, um, we see those uses reflected in some of the statistics we use to track uh, who's using the site and how often. And uh, in the last several years, we've seen a really nice overall increase in the site usage. Um, and it's really starting to peak. And we hear more and more from folks that they're using the site, which is a great thing. Um, but we also see at you know, the fine scale level on individual data sets and on individual topics, we see evidence in the site statistics that people are taking us up on this offer of free data, right? They're looking at the Marine Life page when it was updated over the summer, um, and we saw this threefold increase in people looking at that data and interacting with it, which is a really cool thing to see. Um, and then more uh, practically, we see when there are meetings and issues being discussed in the region, like um, a couple years ago when BOEM announced the three unsolicited bids for offshore wind in the federal waters off Massachusetts and New York, 
we saw all of a sudden uh, lots of folks going to the site and looking at the commercial fishing data, um, just hitting those data set um, at a higher rate than they had over the previous several weeks. So all of those things tell us that the data are um, important and they're being used and they're very desirable on, on these different topics. It's really great to see people um, interacting with them and using them. So aside from those agency uses, the management uses, and even the research uses, what else can the portal do? Um, we're seeing teachers, school teachers in K-12 grades use the portal as a teaching tool. And we actually have a case study up on the site now that describes um, how a teacher in Maine used the portal for um, lessons about ocean uses and the ocean ecosystem. Um, and interestingly enough, there's some uh, teacher resources on this page at the very bottom. There's links to um, a partner uh, entity of ours. Um, they developed some teaching materials that are free for anyone to use. They're for um, elementary and secondary um, grades. And there's a lot of great information, great resources. It goes beyond just the portal, but into other topics like ocean planning and ocean conservation. And, and things like that. And so we're really happy to see the portal being used um, in this way. And we think kids actually really get it and they love looking at maps and it's, it's intuitive. Um, so this is a really awesome partnership to see through. Um, in addition, Nick mentioned Vineyard Wind um, and the topic of offshore wind in general. We see on the BOEM website, they direct uh, their stakeholders to the portal in some cases. Uh, they directly call out the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. Um, and in another example, in a couple of days actually, we're partnering with the Surfrider Foundation for another webinar, which will specifically address how um, citizens, non-experts, can use the portal when they make public comments. Um, and the BOEM snapshot that I show, chose to sh show here also um, happens to be a little statement about the draft environmental impact statement where there's a ton of public meetings happening um, soon to be rescheduled, I think. But um, so there are many opportunities now in New England for the public to comment on projects um, and the portal provides a great way, a great resource for ordinary people, for citizens who are interested in um, various topics to get involved. Another thing that we would like to point out and toot our horn a little bit is um, the senators from Massachusetts and Rhode Island recently sent a letter to BOEM um, asking if they were using the Northeast Ocean Data Portal in their decision making. Um, and we just wanted to highlight that as you know, another case where the portal is getting increased um, recognition and um, increased use that uh, is really influential and um, important for decision making in the region. And finally, um, what perhaps could be most relevant to some of the folks on the phone um, as journalists, uh, reporters, and the like, um, we've seen the portal used in the media and in reporting. And this is something that we'd really like to foster, which is part of the reason why we partnered with Metcalf on this webinar, um, is we think it's a really great resource for journalists to supplement and augment their reporting. Um, in this case, the Providence Journal used the portal. They actually downloaded the data um, themselves and brought it to their graphics department and made these great graphics that support reporting about offshore wind. Um, there's lots of other examples of ways the portal data could be used to support and supplement um, environmental reporting. And so if folks have specific questions about that or you're navigating the portal and you have a question about a data set, uh, we're here, Nick and I and others who work um, on the portal are here as a resource to you um, to help interpret data and help um, make sure that you have access to the data that you need. So don't hesitate to um, reach out to us at any point in the future. At the end, I'll put our email addresses up on um, the last slide to make sure you have our contact info. Um, but we would love to foster and, and, and see more examples just like this. Um, Okay, and so with that, I'm going to go to the live demo. So I'm gonna pause sharing for a second. Okay. All right. Are you seeing my um, data portal window now? Great, fantastic. Okay, um, so this is the homepage. And 
Um, first thing that probably jumps out at you is that we have a notice up on the home page about the government shutdown. Some of our data sets are affected by the government shutdown, but fewer than you would think. So I encourage you to still click around. Um, we have, like I said in the beginning, thousands of data sets and the majority are functional. But we put this notice here just so that folks are aware there may be some lapses in the availability of some of the data sets. Um, I'm going to walk you through just a basic workflow for how you might begin to explore data on the portal. It looks overwhelming when you get to this homepage um, in some ways. So there's a lot of different themes, a lot of different topics, and a lot going on. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much about resources other than the mapping tools, but there are tons of things to explore that I've already mentioned, like case studies, um, the data download page, and when there's questions and answers period at the end, maybe we can get into some of that. So the first thing is, if you've never been to the portal before, I would encourage you to explore the theme maps, which are these icons that represent the different ocean uses and resources. Um, I've sort of preloaded some things here so that we don't have to worry about load times. I clicked on the marine transportation theme, um, and then I clicked over to the commercial traffic uh, button on the bar up top. And what we're looking at now is a theme map. So this is a suite of data products that are only about marine transportation, only about commercial traffic. Um, and we have the option to click through different maps using these radio buttons. Um, what we're looking at is all vessel transit counts from 2017. So this is the record of all vessels that have transited the uh, New England's oceans in 2017, roughly. Um, and we also have these uh, different vessel categories. So you can look at just cargo vessels and where their uh, transit paths are. You can look at just passenger vessels. Passenger vessels are things like ferries. So you start to see the really familiar ferry routes um, in the region. There's tug tow, fishing vessel, tanker, pleasure craft, and then this other category. Uh, so there's some really interesting patterns in this data alone to explore. Um, and just at this annual basis, looking at the different vessel types, it's fairly interesting. Um, another feature in this data set is that we can actually use the drop down to select monthly um, transit counts. Because when you look at the whole year, you might be wondering, well, you know, we have such strong seasons in New England, perhaps vessel traffic changes depending on what time of year. Um, and you would be right. So we see a huge increase in just all vessel traffic when we get to the summer months. Um, and then we see it decline again when we get back to winter. And we're looking at all vessels, but we can look at these for all of the different uh, vessel categories and, and look at those seasonal patterns. And these aren't just interesting, they can be really important to planning a project offshore um, or deciding on some management action that has a seasonal component. These data sets let um, agencies and other folks really understand uh, who's using the ocean and when, and where and when there might be particular conflicts. So we're just looking at these data sets alone. Um, of course, you can zoom in um, to various regions and get a you know, more fine scale view, but you also might be wondering like, okay, well, we get the vessel traffic thing. What could there be conflicts with? What other data sets might we want to look at? Um, or what could be um, a compatible use with vessel traffic? In order to overlay other data sets on these maps and really get that um, analysis going, we would click View and Data Explorer. Um, and when we click View and Data Explorer, it will bring over all of the maps that we have selected into a separate, a new window, um, where we have the full catalog of data available to us, everything that is in our catalog on the Northeast Ocean Data Portal is now contained in this window in this table of contents on the left. It's still organized by theme, but we have these little drop down arrows now so that you can um, add and remove any additional data sets that you might want. Um, that's this all layers tab in the table of contents. In the active layers tab, we see what we actually have turned on here, which is the 2017 all vessel transit counts and we're looking at annual, but we can do the same thing that we did in the theme map and sort of click through and look at um, the individual months. I've 
added some additional data sets here that I thought might be interesting to overlay, which are the recent um, wind energy area or the recent lease areas. I'm going to zoom in fairly tightly to those. Actually, I'll choose Rhode Island so we can get like a little bit of a wider view. Um, and we can look at where vessels might be going at any time of year through and around these lease areas. Um, interestingly, you can see some increased vessel activity around the Block Island turbines. Um, you can see the path that some vessels take um, from Block Island out to the turbines. Um, this sort of analysis is happening real time with some of these issues uh, related to projects that are in development or being proposed in this particular area here, the Vineyard Wind area. So um, folks are actively using uh, the resources on the portal to do the types of analyses that we're actually kind of doing right now, where we're um, overlaying transit data and looking for times of year or particular vessel routes. Um, the, one, the issue that, they, that is being examined is fishing vessel transits. Um, so we can click through and try to understand the seasonality of fishing vessels in the area and um, how their traffic might be um, in conflict or compatible with particular developments in these, in these zones. Um, one thing I did want to just point out, and this is because I, am an, I came from an oceanography school, okay, and I look at these data with a science lens. Um, I happen to notice that in the other vessel transit category in October, um, in these wind energy areas, in these lease areas, you can see evidence of a very systematic survey happening. Um, and so this looks like someone's exploring these sites, um, maybe doing some geophysical surveys or um, other data collection that might help inform how they build their construction operations plan or how they, you know, um, support permitting and things like that, support the environmental impact statement. And I just think this is really cool when we do see um, evidence of activities that we know are happening and it actually is reflected in the data. I think that's really cool. So I just wanted to point that out as something that was um, really interesting. And if you're into digging into data and really looking at it with using a fine tooth comb, you can find some really cool things. Okay, so those are a couple human uses that we looked at. I just want to really quickly point out we have tons of ecosystem and ecological data on the site as well. I've pulled up here um, an abundance layer for the North Atlantic right whale, which is obviously a species of concern in our region. Um, and we're looking at its April abundance. So again, we have this ability to use some of the tools on the portal to look at some fine scale temporal detail and really get a sense for how resources and uses can be changing uh, throughout a given year. Um, and we see that in April, there's actually a fairly high concentration of, or relatively high concentration of whales versus a month like, I don't know, maybe October. Um, we have to turn off the April to see the October where it's quite low. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of looking for conflicts and anticipating permitting issues or anticipating um, potential impacts of uh, developments offshore, we can use these ecosystem data sets as well to address that. So that's just a taste of what we have here. This is such an enormous resource, it's hard to be comprehensive in such a short period of time. Um, I encourage you though to explore, contact us if um, you are interested in asking additional questions or you have interpretive, uh, interpretive issues or you know, want to discuss how certain data sets um, overlay or how to do something or if something is not working, please contact us. Um, we're, like I said, we're here as a resource. I'm going to put up that slide with our um, contact information while I pause and turn it back over to Sunshine um, to see if there are any questions or comments that we can address. Thank you, Emily. Um, really appreciate that overview of this amazing tool. So, a couple questions for you here, and everybody who's on the line, please feel free to share your questions either via the chat menu or via the Q&A um, function on WebEx. Um, the first one is with all of the recent developments in offshore wind in New England as the context for this, how often is the portal updated? Um, and how, where can you find out which of the data sets, the many data sets you have, have been updated and when? Yes. Is there a way for a user to figure that out? 
Yes, there is. Um, and first, the um, answer to the question about how often are, are things updated, um, we update data sets as often as the agencies provide those data sets. So for example, those lease areas um, that we showed, those come from BOEM. Um, and as soon as uh, they have an update to share uh, reflecting you know, a recent decision or um, anything like that, it's within a matter of weeks we're able to get those data sets back uh, updated up on the portal. Um, a great way to keep in touch with us about what data sets have been recently updated is to sign up for our newsletter, to follow us on Twitter. We usually tweet every time we have uh, a new data set released or updated. And just checking the site itself, our news page, which also appears on the home page, um, all of those methods will get you a comprehensive listing of what is updated and when. Um, I also want to show how you can learn more about the specific data sets and when they've been updated. So I didn't do this at all, but if you click um, on this little button box with an arrow that says layer information when you mouse over it, um, it tells you a lot about the data. It gives you the source, a description, and you can sort of glean when it's been updated um, from some of this information. And um, if you can't, then the official metadata will tell you when it's been updated. Um, and you know, all the different resources in these layer info boxes will be really informative to helping you track down that type of information. Um, Emily, just so you know, thank you for that. But just so you know, this, what we're seeing on the screen right now, was when you were talking about where to look for this on the website, is actually the, the contact information slide. Oh, OK. Um, so if you can switch to that other, to the um, portal itself and show that again, that would be great. Okay, have I switched? Now, yeah, now we see it. Okay, so I clicked this square, the button that I said was a square with an arrow that says layer information when you mouse over it is this little thing here. Um, and it pops open, I'll close it so you can see it again. It pops open this layer info box that tells you the source information. Here's the metadata link down here. Um, and a, a lot of just different background and context about the data set itself that'll help you get that information. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh, so, and kind of a continuation of that question then is, um, the, can you find out about potential limitations of the data through, through this, this metadata platform too? Or is that something where people really need to ask you or you know, some member of the, the Northeast Regional Ocean Council or Data Portal team for more information? Yeah, so data limitations are really important. Um, we just now, I spent you know, 30 minutes or so telling you how awesome the data are, um, but every data has limitations, right? And they all have conditions about you know, when they were collected, what they're representative of. And so we encourage users to really dig into that background information, some of which is here in this layer info box. A lot of it is contained in the metadata. Um, in the case of some of the more complex data layers, like the North Atlantic right whale abundance layer that I showed, um, and those uh, just whale and um, fish and bird resources in general, um, these data sets, uh, let's open layer information, there we go. So these data sets actually come with a lot more documentation that explains some of those limitations. Um, it tells you the method for how the data were developed and how they're visualized. So this one comes with its own technical report, which is you know, a multi-page document that um, gets into the limitations. We have similar documentation for the transit data and for you know, the commercial fishing data and all of that stuff within the layer info boxes and within the metadata, it'll describe to you um, some of the things, some of the caveats and things you should be looking out for if you're going to be interpreting the data and using it. Great. Thank you. Um, and I guess uh, another question would be, um, and maybe a last question unless we see any others come through, would be, um, are there other ocean data sets or, or information outside of the portal that it's important for portal users to know about? Yes, definitely. So um, the 
portal itself is obviously a very rich resource, um, but it is not the only resource and it's not the only purveyor of data on this topic. Um, and a lot of uh, the agencies themselves are great resources for additional information and often very site-specific information. And so um, I've heard the phrase, it's not one-stop shopping, it's first-stop shopping. So you come here to get a sense for what type of data you might need for your question or your issue. Um, and maybe we have everything you need here, but there are other um, places to go as well. And a lot of the um, resources that I've shown in these layer info boxes and in the technical reports and in the metadata, it includes the contact information for um, experts in the region, or it actually includes links to additional resources where you can learn more or get a different um, representation of the same data or a different representation of the same topic. And I think that's really important for folks to be um, thinking about as they explore the resources on the portal. Great. Um, wonderful. Well, this thank you so much, um, both Emily and Nick, for this fantastic overview of what is clearly a really rich tool. Um, also, we will be hosting another webinar. Our next webinar in the series will actually be January 30th. That will feature Ed Maybach from George Mason University's um, Center for Climate Change Communication and Bernadette woods Plackey from Climate Central. They will be talking about a uh, collaboration that they have that other groups are involved in also uh, called Climate Matters that is um, using a lot of public opinion data, collecting and, and analyzing and sharing public opinion data regarding climate change, as well as um, other resources for journalists to expand climate change uh, reporting all over the country. Uh, for now, thank you so much, Emily and Nick. We really appreciate your time and um, look forward to sharing this resource with a lot more people. Thank you, and thanks, thank everybody. You. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.